and I'm going to hit my share screen. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. I do have a disclaimer to say before we get started. Uh, this is a CRC study group. So we're studying, most of us here are studying to earn our licensures uh, between now and the end of next year. Um, this group will not guarantee you to pass the CRC exam. Uh, you yourself as an individual are ultimately responsible for your own commitment and time to study. Uh, this group is designed for professionals like you and myself to help one another grasp the better knowledge of rehabilitation work and to collaborate together to build our knowledge and expertise towards becoming a certified rehab counselor. I am a certified rehab counselor. All materials and lectures and information are not funded or sponsored apart by myself or any of the agencies themselves. I'm talking about state, federal, government, nonprofit. It's a collective of everything. Uh, you are required to pay for your own textbooks. Again, I recommend the Red Book. Uh, uh, the thing is the third edition. Um, with that, if you're looking for other additional materials, you're responsible for your own payment for that. We do share some stuff with one another around here when we can. Uh, we do have Quizlet. We do have a few of those. But ultimately, it's up to you to get your own study materials. Uh, with that, this group does not represent any major organizations, companies, schools, or institutions, nor will it solicit any particular government or non-government interest. So... We are here as individuals and we're not here as part of some sort of uh, for-profit or not-for-profit entity. Uh, everything contributed to this group is solely voluntary, has zero mandates. However, the more you contribute, the more you involve yourself, the better we can help one another earn our credentials and the easier it's going to be for you when you sit for your exam. So <clears throat> as you're coming in here, I am uh, adding you into the group and uh, welcome. So my name is Kennedy. I am a certified rehab counselor. And uh, I just real quick, I started this group because uh, many of us uh, across the U.S. had difficulties either finding people to study with. Uh, we all share similar commonalities. We all wanted to become vocational rehab counselors, at least get that that certification. And so since the, the inception of this in January to now, this has been a pretty active group. And I do thank you all for your, some of your commitment. For those who are returning, thank you for your commitment. For new ones coming, welcome. Okay. Uh, with that, we're just going to go straight into the lectures. And can everybody see my lecture slides? Yes, I can. All right. <laughs> Not like last time where I didn't have it open. So this first part is going to be long. Uh, I'm going to try to get through as much as possible. But um, what I'm going to encourage you, and I sent it out previously, though, is I gave you guys the PDF expert. And depending on what version you get of the CRC exam, some of the exams may be content heavy on this area here more than others. If not, even if it's not as content heavy, you will see some information related to these disabilities because that's what we're specializing in. So, so today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the medical aspects of individuals with chronic diseases and disabilities. Um, I put this here as an additional extra. This came directly out of the book. If you're not fully familiar with a lot of medical terms and, and medical terminology and knowledge, I would encourage you to study this to make sure you're up to date. This is especially important for students if they're really coming from a non-clinical side to a clinical type work. Um, if you have prior clinical experiences, some of these things may sound very similar, but if not, these are terms you do need to understand because as a rehab counselor, you will be looking at medical documentation. So, and I got you, Tam. <clears throat> so first areas we're going to start with is talking about the most common ones, which are the physical disabilities. Uh, and this is very briefly, we're talking about spinal cord injuries, TBI, stroke, multiple sclerosis. Now, the way I'm going to present this is what the testers want you to know in the exam, which you should know. Okay. They're not going to do a lot of trick questions because, again, sometimes the answers are within the questions, especially when it comes to these type of things. Other times, it's if you're not too sure what the disability is, study on it so you get familiar with it. Okay. So one of the first areas is the spinal cord injury. And I chose this one first because this one is fairly frequent, especially for those with disabilities looking for work. Uh, it Depending on how severe uh, the disability is in terms of spinal cord injury, and we're talking about complete versus incomplete spinal cord injuries, which if you're not too sure what that term is, you need to look it up. Also, too, uh, what they want to know is, do you know at what levels can people function? 
So for instance, between the C levels, T levels, L levels, S levels. We'll talk about a couple of those here a little more in detail. Uh, with that, keep in mind, depending on where the spinal cord injury level is, in some questions for CRC, they're going to ask you, you know, at what levels of the spinal cord injury, whether it's complete or incomplete, does a person require an, a respiratory assistance? And I believe I want to say it's the C level. Uh, with that, too, you need to know kind of medications people with spinal cord injuries are treated with. Uh, it's depending if it's like especially an incomplete spinal cord injury, maybe it's hurting a disc or stuff like that. Um, they're usually going to get pain relievers because they have chronic pain. For example. Now, I also included this here because you do need to understand enough of it. You have the cervical vertebrae. You have the thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, and the sacrum. And if you read the book or if you do some Googling, it's going to tell you that depending on where the C level, T levels, or L level injuries at, what the person can and cannot do. For instance, most of the time, if somebody has a complete spinal cord injury in the cervical vertebrae, more than likely they're going to need respiratory assistance and they're not going to be able to move much of their arms and limbs via, I want to say, a quadriplegic and sometimes paraplegic, depending. Uh, now, if incomplete, they may have some functioning, but they might still need additional respiratory assistance. When it comes to the thoracic vertebrae, depending on where the level's at, it's going to depend on whether or not they can use their arms for limited movement or if they're able to move their torso. Um, going lower, down, especially towards the lumbar area, this is where we see people that have maybe an uneven gait, maybe uh, they, they had a lower back injury, so they may not be able to control some of their bowel movements and uh, they may need additional assistance, or it, it could be something as easy as maybe just having, uh, I wanna say they're like prosthetics, but basically leg straps to help them. Um, so what I would encourage you to do and what the CRC is gonna look for is, what is the level, of, what's the disability, the spinal cord injury, what are the levels of it that affect the person? What do you as a rehab counselor could do to treat for them? Or if not, what are they treating for? Those are what the, most of the time they're gonna ask you. Any questions about the spinal cord injury? Nope. Okay. So, again, I encourage you to read the Red Book. YouTube has a lot of great videos on this, giving you in details. I mean, there's so much studies behind this here. There's even therapies now to help people rehabilitate, you know, to continue work, to continue their life function, being independent. But as a rehab counselor, you're getting to understand that if somebody has an occupational injury where they fell off a, uh, a ladder and they hit their, and they, and they did an incomplete uh, fracture of their lumbar L4 spine. What are you going to be the type of system devices they're going to need? And what type of alternative work are you going to need to place them into? That's the kind of stuff that they're going to want you to know too. So next one is traumatic brain injury. It's physical because it requires some sort of blast or explosion usually, or uh, sometimes a vehicle accident. You're hit, you're pretty much, your brain gets rocked within the, the, the skull and it can cause bruising and dependent on severity, severe injuries. Uh, with that, when we talk about TBI and CRC, they may ask you the difference between an open and a closed injury. Uh, when it's a, I want to see if they got have it in here. No, I don't have it in here, but it's fine. Um, what they could ask you is by age group, what kind of injuries are going to be most prevalent? So for instance, for, uh, for young and elderly, most of the time a traumatic brain injury is going to occur because of a fall. Uh, when it comes to adolescents and young adults, it's usually vehicle accidents with alcohol being a factor, violent assaults and suicide. If you want to go into military, it's usually going to be a blast injury, an explosion. Okay. Um, what they want to know is also, too, some of the major types of brain injuries. Open, okay, open head and then how. Open head and, and closed. Closed head, open head, and then blast injury. How? Okay. There are two, but... I also include the blast injury as part of it. So um, so for your sake, again, in rehab counseling, what they want you to know is, for the most part, the difference between the open head and closed head injury, 
what areas is it going to affect the brain? Because depending if it's the left or right right uh, hemisphere of the brain or potentially both. Um, what can be some long-term chronic implications of it? As far as like long, especially from like a mild traumatic brain injury to a severe traumatic brain injury uh, or profound. Um, and also they're going to want you to know, you know, some of the treatment process for it, which a lot of times maybe uh, it's going to be a cycle, not cycle, but it's going to be some sort of behavior th therapy, maybe with some medication interventions and a few other additional things. For instance, some people with traumatic brain injuries like myself, who had in the back right occipital area of the brain where it affects my left eye, I have to sometimes adjust the brightness because I can get migraines and I can get headaches. Um, you see that a lot. Uh, for kids, if it's on the Wernicke or Broca's area of the brain, that could also affect their functioning. So if you're not too familiar with the brain itself too, I would encourage you to read on those. Okay, Read on the different areas of the brain how the TBI can affect the individual's brain if there's going to be some short and long-term residual effects. And that is also in the red book. I also put some uh, information here because one of the ways a rehab counselor or even a clinician can assess for somebody's severity of the brain injury or traumatic brain injury is using a Glasgow coma scale. Not to be confused with glaucoma, Glasgow coma scale or GCS. Okay, if you're not familiar with that, I did include some YouTube videos in here so you can reference those. But the key here is if in the question they're saying that a person had a recent traumatic closed headed brain injury and had a Glasgow coma scale of five, what does that five mean? You know, you're going to need to know how it affects the person's ability to do stuff. And by the way, if a person has a Closed head traumatic brain injury at five, they're for the most part hospitalized almost towards a state of coma. <laughs> so then you want to read on this. Uh, but the, the lower the number, the more severe it is. That's the easiest way to, to remember this here. If it's the higher the number, the better. Okay. That also lets, can give you an indicator as far as what are the levels from a, a mild traumatic brain injury to a concussion to a severe head trauma. Okay. So my recommendation is definitely check out these videos here, hop on YouTube, understand about the GCS scale and how the levels are going to affect somebody. Because the question can be, again, if they ask about that severity level, what are some of the symptoms associated with that? They're going to say ataxia, apraxia, hemoparalysis, physical. I don't want to mispronounce that. See, oops. Sequelae. Cognitive sequelae and psychosocial sequelae. So they're going to want you to understand those levels. And of course, there are going to be some attitudinal barriers with the effects of caregivers experiencing those with TBI. So if anybody with a disability, especially if it's a chronic disability, at, at some point, if they cannot be self-sufficient for themselves, they may need a caregiver, whether it's a parent, uh, whether it's a loved one, or somebody's hired. Um, now keep in mind, that's for... Every disability, depending on the severity level, it, it's not just for one particular one. So I only mention it in here, but in almost all the other disabilities that are going to be talked about, there's always going to be an instance of potential problems for caregivers dealing with stress. Okay, next one we're going to talk about here very briefly. This is stroke or cerebral vas vascular accident or CVA. Now, in clinical terms, it's basically a decreased blood flow and loss of oxygen to the brain. It's chemic, and it causes tissue damage or blood clot or, or thrombus via artery. Uh, what they want you to know when it comes to stroke is how does it affect one side of the body? What are the, long, of course, the long-term effects of it? And um, how does it affect the individual's learning functions and abilities? Uh there has been an uptick in younger people developing strokes faster, unfortunately, uh, especially those who are older in the 50s and higher. You see it's higher instances of strokes um, that also can lead to more underlying issues. Maybe there's heart problems going on with the person. Maybe there's more other serious things happening. Um, so I would encourage you to definitely check out the YouTube videos that I posted on here on the link. Uh, if you want, I can put one on now, but if not, Definitely check those out because it's going to give you a detailed overview. With that too, 
one of the things they're going to ask you is some of the treatments that are used to treat not only for stroke, but for other disabilities. So for instance, when it comes to the term for stroke, they're going to want you to know what kind of medication they're going to treat them with. Usually it's going to be blood pressure, uh, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers. So I don't think the CRC is going to be too specific to say, you know, how exactly does a calcium channel blocker work? Because that's going straight into neuroscience. But what they are going to ask is what are the list of, or some of the instances of, of combination of medications are used to treat people for stroke, for stroke include what of which the following or it can say except. But for you, you need to understand, you know, what kind of stuff they can use. Now, keep in mind, if they're talking specifically about an ischemic ischemic stroke it's only specific ones that are being used and that's the uh it's going to be an anticoagulant sodium channel blockers or potassium channel blockers it just depends on the type of uh, specific type of stroke that's occurring any questions or thoughts so far or anybody want to share experience or know somebody who dealt with this here or we're trying to find a job nope okay Okay, so again, one of the big things when it comes to strokes, for the most part, is a lot of times it's going to affect a person's mobility. Um, it can lead, especially if a person's been working for a long time and they end up having a stroke, they might end up having to leave their job, maybe file for claim for disability, depending on the severity, it may lead to going to workers' compensation. And that puts a person, in, of course, into a state of depression, uh, especially in men that have been manually labored most of their lives, but because they weren't taking care of their health or due to other uh, congenital or uh, genetic-based issues, uh, this happened. And so um, as a rehab counselor, we have to recognize and understand that when they are coming to us, they're either mid-recovery or already in recovery, and they're having a hard time trying to find what kind of career they can switch into with a post-stroke because there are, of course, long-term effects. And so for us, we need to understand, you know, what can we do to help them? So some of the things that the book mentions is barriers to accessibility, which is making sure restroom systems, policy, transportation are in, are in progress. So if the person has had a stroke and they can no longer drive, they're going to need somebody to help them drive or they're going to end up taking a bus. So then the question is, do you put them in a, in a remote based job so they can work from home? Or if they don't want a remote based job, uh, what is going to be their means of transportation getting to work? What kind of work do you want to put them into? You know, those kind of things. So, and, and that goes with a lot of other physical disabilities, but stroke in particular, because um, it can affect one whole side of the body and lose, and they can lose function. All right. Next disease that's talked about in the book is multiple sclerosis or MS. This has been out for a while, but it's relatively emerging. It does happen a lot more in, in white women than men, but it's not to say it doesn't happen in other uh, racial identities. Okay. Um, basically, the understanding of multiple sclerosis or MS so far is caused by an immune system or dysregulation. So there's also a range that's assessed and tested for. Um, but it takes a combination of different things to test to, to confer a diagnosis for multiple sclerosis. It's not an easy thing to diagnose. Um, it's also the hard part about it is that it's a relapsing remitting disease. What it means is that it can, a person, it could go into remission for a while, several years, a person's functioning, doing everything fine. Let's say they're in the height of their career after five years working at a location, then it relapses, it becomes prevalent, it affects their abilities to do stuff such as, you know, having vision problems, weak stiff muscles, tingling numbness, difficult waking, bladder control, those kind of things. And then that will affect their ability to continue working, you know, because they might have to end up either reducing hours or even dropping hours. Now, one of the things that, some of the stuff that, that research has shown is that medications can be used to treat multiple sclerosis, but it's not a cure. There's not really a whole lot for a care for it, but they may do certain doctors may use things like, you know, injectable medications for modifying the disease. Uh, I'm not too sure what exactly what inter interferon, beta 1A1 bleed or order medications are, but there are different ways to treat for it. Uh, these lists of medications here are very specific. So to treat MS, depending on the severity of it. So if you're familiar with things like prednisone, fumarate or dimethyl, 
uh, or even pregnant, so itself, you can realize, realize that these are the, they share a similar uh, family of drugs, but it's what's usually used to treat them. Now, why is this important in rehab counseling? Well, depending on the type of medication that's given to the individual, especially someone with multiple sclerosis, their side effects could affect their ability to work. It may improve their health, but it could affect some of their ability to work in, in simplest terms. So my recommendation when you, if you're trying to understand more about multiple cirrhosis is, of course, understand how hard it is to diagnose it, um, who it affects the most, what are going to be some of the long-term uh, effects from it. Because, again, it's relapsing, remitting. It's not like it, it's a one-time treatment and that's all. And also you want to know um, how these medications affect the person individually. On CRC, they may describe what the person is going through. And the example can be saying, oh, okay, this person has been experiencing several of these symptoms recently at work, and they're not able to complete their job, and they were referred to you for workman's compensation. They need to help with an assessment. You suspect that this person may be experiencing, what, multiple cirrhosis. So just an example, okay? And then we're going to talk about the other one, which is the sensory disabilities, uh, visual and hearing impairments. Now, when I took my CRC exam, I did have a quick few questions asking me about vision exam, uh, about visual impairments. So I'm not going to tell you exactly what they said, but basically they really want to know is, oh, where are we at? Okay. Let me get rid of this here. My slides are slightly out of order, so I apologize about that. And that was not meant to happen, but it's okay. Let me pause it real quick. I'm gonna cut this out. Leave that for the bottom. Sorry about that. I thought I had these all in in uh, order. So, okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Went ahead and paused that. So back into recording there. So sorry about that. So the next one we're going to talk about are visual impairments and hearing impairments. So for vision, um. What they're going to ask you is the types of visual impairments and you as the rehab counselor, as a candidate, need to understand or know the difference between cataracts versus glaucoma or retinal tear, detachments, diabetic retinopathy, retinitis, pigmentosa, and macular degeneration. And they're going to use those medical terms in there. So it's up to you to make sure you study. Um what those terms are there's plenty of resources out there youtube is your best friend for this here and understanding how that affects the individual because once you know how that happens you can also know how that's going to affect the eye as far as you know does it cause myopia hyperopia astigmatism presbyopia those kind of things um you also need to know for the in the united states uh, the visual acuity for being legally blind. Hint, I gave you an example, which if it's anything that's 20 over 200, a person is legally blind. Uh, that means that they're not supposed to be able to drive. They might not even be able to drive at night. Okay. Uh, you also know, need to know the difference between different types of visual impairments, such as if it's temporary, reversible, progressive, or permanent leading to blindness. Um, of course, it could be acquired or typically can be degenerative. Also, too, um, one of the things that the CRC is going to ask you as well is, do you understand the some of the psychosocial aspects of visual impairments, uh, especially those who are either born with blindness or those who become blind? Um, so, for example, as we as we as adults get older, our vision starts to deteriorate. We're not like in our twenties where we have super 
super sharp vision. Some people can have super sharp vision for a very long time. For me, I use these because it's hard for me to read a book and, and read on um read on the uh, screen because it's macular degeneration. But for other people, they'd be just fine, but they can't see from here to the other end of the wall. Um, there's also, of course, fogging around the eyes. Uh, maybe sometimes within the retina, it just forms itself. Or that could be, uh, you could be born with that. And of course, you know, there may be other issues where you're not able to see fully straight and follow and function. So when it comes to that, a lot of times, especially if it's vision and blindness, thankfully, there's a lot of tools and resources out there. Look at this. So for instance, especially in today's technology, we have things that treat for this. Uh, usually the most common one are glasses and contact lenses. Uh, there's correct eye surgery, depending on what it is, such as LASIK surgery. Uh, if you're not too sure what vi what virectomies are, it definitely deals with something to do with uh, typically people who are diabetic and they have bleeding in the back of the eye and ultimately they stick a needle in there to drain it. Um, of course, they use the walking stick with instructions. There's Braille. Uh, and now these things here are current technologies that are out there, such as OrCam, Noisy Vision, Shark, and Jaws are similar to screen readers. So in rehabilitation counseling, depending on the type of blindness somebody or the type or level of blindness somebody has, um, it's also going to depend on, on what kind of assistive devices can this person use. A lot of people with blindness use computers and social media and phones today. There's a lot of resources out there for that are very helpful. Is it accessible to everybody though? That's the question. Um, the more expensive stuff comes from the doctors is, you know, can certain corrective surgery help them and for how long? So in terms of the CRC, what they want to hear, what they would want you to know or what you should know is specifically the different types of vision disorders, how they work, what do they affect um, and what are some ways we can treat for it in, in the simplest of terms? Any questions or thoughts? Nope. No. All right. Thank you, Tam. <laughs> Going right into it. So the next part of the other half of this is hearing impairments. Oh, before you know what, I'm going to take a step back here. There are several programs that federal agencies use for people with blindness to do certain functions. Uh, think about Wagner O'Day Act. Okay, if you want to go back to when we were talking in the beginning about different laws put into place, Wagner O'Day is a big prominent one of them. And there's several other acts related to that where they allow people with blindness to vend and sell stuff. Now, in today's in today's world, we have programs such as Ability One that specifically hires people with visual or hearing or some sort of uh, specific disability to work in the industry to help create products, manufacture products for the government. So if you're not too sure with that, I encourage you to read up Ability One. And there's a few other ones too. I think there's Ameri... I Don't quote me on it. I think it's American Serve or Americana. I have to double check it, but there's several. And it's because of that Wagner Day Act that allows people with disabilities such as visual and hearing impairments to work in those type of industries, making products and made here in the USA. So if you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to take a look at it, do some research on it. it. It could be helpful for you. And maybe you have some clients that you're taking care of. It might be helpful to reach out to those resources as well. So going on to hearing impairments. So the key thing here when it comes to hearing hearing impairments is based on if a person is considered by definition hard of hearing or deaf. Of course, some people can be born deaf or they acquired over time or depending on what the issue is, it may develop to start losing hearing as they age. Uh, in today's world, we're all about loud noises and loud blasting music, so when, especially when we're in our 20s and we're not thinking about later when we get older. And what do we have? At least for veterans, is what? Tinnitus. <laughs> The constant ringing in the ear, stuff like that. For others, they may end up potentially losing most or all of it. And what in the CRC exam, what they're going to want you to know is, you know, the hearing loss severity ranges from either partial to total, temporary to permanent, or very mild loss to profile. 
profound loss. And how you're going to determine that is if the question asks you or tells you that a person received a score of 50 to six, 56 to 70 decibels um, and they had a moderate hearing loss, what is that considered? They considered a hard of hearing or they consider clinically deaf. And you, as the rehab counselor, are going to need to know and understand that. With that, they also want you is what kind of assistive devices would you use? Would you use an implant? Would you use a hearing aid? Would you give them sign language? So my recommendation, especially when it comes to when we talk about hearing here, is understand the levels of normal hearing to profound hearing. And of course, when is it considered on the on the levels here, hard of hearing versus clinically deaf? Okay. Now, I kind of made this as simple as possible, but I would encourage you to read the book because it goes specifically into more details. But definitely make sure if you're not familiar with this, study this. Okay. Um, with that, too, when I was talking about, you know, whether it's whether they're born with it or whether it's acquired or noise induced. Okay. Uh, congenital, which is pretty much they were born without being able to hear. Um, I'm sure many of you may or may not have seen that video where I, I forget what country it's in. Uh, the child was born deaf. And what they did is that they put a special implant. Now we have technology that does implants to actually allow uh, children who are deaf or those who are young and deaf be able to actually hear. Now, is that accessible to everybody? No. But is, is that technology progressing? Absolutely. And I think that's a blessing. So that's something to think about. Uh, also, too, I mentioned these diseases in here. Because in some countries, depending if you're working with immigrants, some of the congenital factors of being deaf could be a cause from a previous infection that the that the mother had or was in received an infection with and they were born with that. That doesn't happen all the time. It's not saying this is going to cause this all the time. What does it say that in addition to being born deaf, there are some other environmental factors or disease, or disease factors that can cause a child or somebody to be born congenitally blind or deaf? Of course, there's acquired. Uh, this usually talks about stuff like recurrent ear infections or tightest media. This is children that have, sometimes they may be premature birth. Uh, they may have some sort of immune issues such as severe allergies and asthma, that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it can happen over time. And then of course, there's the noise induced, loud noises, explosions. And I mentioned vibrations because depending on how hard the vibration is, busting the eardrum, it can cause bleeding. So in today's world, we have a lot of resources that are used and by the ADA's laws um, are required, especially for federal agencies or companies to communicate with those who are deaf. Uh, of course, there is our American Sign Language. Uh, there's hearing aids or assistive listening devices. Uh, another one, of course, is the hearing implants, which is also considered an ALD. So maybe the CRCD asks you about what kind of AL ALDs are there. Well, there's hearing aids and hearing implants. Uh, for some people, they need, they can get medical surgery. Depending on if it's disease-related, it could be medication. Of course, there's the telecommunication devices for the deaf, which is a TDD, and the v, VOIP teletype writers where you're talking into something and then it types it out for the individual on the other side. Uh, we even have interpreters today. Uh, when I used to do call center work um, and I had to talk to somebody who was deaf, uh, we had an interpreter give us a call and we talked through them to the individual to do screenings. And then, of course, I, I mentioned this here. It's not really in a book, but lip reading. So this really goes more for those who have maybe they lost hearing over time. And so sometimes it's more it's easier for them to understand if they see your lips moving to uh, make sure they're understanding the words that are being said to them. Now, one of the things I didn't mention on here is uh is some of the social factors, especially when it comes to hearing loss. Um, as we get older, we do lose hearing over time. Uh, people do become hard of hearing or deaf. And sometimes, especially if they're elderly, we may be repeating ourselves four to five times. And it happens natural. However, sometimes that can be a little frustrating because you're like, why am I repeating myself three to four times when this person should know what I'm saying? And a lot of times it, it's not their fault that they're losing that hearing. It's sometimes you maybe got to change how you approach them. So like, for instance, uh, when I talk to some people, especially if I know if they're hard of hearing or they consider themselves deaf, I'll usually try to face them directly 
and talk to them straight before moving anywhere else. So they see my lips moving and they can hear a little bit what I'm saying and they can articulate in their mind, oh, you're saying X, Y, and Z. It's sometimes it's helpful. Uh, we have a person at my current job that he's a IT tech and he is fully deaf. Uh, he, he uses some hearing implants, but most of the time he's completely deaf and we communicate back and forth via messaging, especially when I'm having computer problems with my stuff. But when I saw him face to face, and we were trying to talk. We just wrote things down to say what we needed, what we needed help with, and what we can and cannot do. And we communicated just fine. I wanted to, personally, I do want to take some training in American Sign Language. I would encourage you all to take some training in American Sign Language because that's just going to make you better in the field of voc rehab and make you more profitable later on. So I'm not going to touch on this one. We're going to touch on this here later on part two for when we talk about arthritis and lupus, because it goes into a little more towards some of the psychological and late, late chronic stuff of pain. Okay. Um, one thing, again, I'm not going to touch on is I'm not going to touch on the mental and psychiatric disabilities only because most of us here are clinicians or have worked with somebody or have enough training to understand it. If you're not too sure what would be mentioned on the CRC, I encourage you to go to the red book. Uh, especially look at DSM-5 revision TR uh, because there are some new emerging disorders that are clinical in nature. And so that's going to just help you to become better at understanding that. So again, refer to DSM-5. Now, next area I'm going to touch on is developmental disabilities. These are your stuff like autism, intellectual disability. Um, we're not going to touch too much on Down syndrome because that's a genetic disorder. And uh, I think there's one more too that we don't touch too much on, but they basically, basically fall under the development of disabilities. So now I put this on here for you because if you heard me earlier before the lecture, um, DSM no longer recognizes the term Asperger's syndrome as part of a field within the spectrum. I believe somebody mentioned it was PDD. Uh, you'll just have to check that. And definitely if you're not too sure what that is, Google it, Google Google what is PDD or personality development disorder. I could be wrong. And also too, I put a resource link in here that comes from the National Institute of Health that establishes why, and it's been out since uh, the term got removed out in 2013. This here was written in 2017. So I mentioned this to you because some people may still consider themselves having or or still know it as Asperger's. A lot of older people still call Asperger'sism as a syndrome. But according to now, in today's modern, uh, today technology or today's world, we no longer consider that. So I don't know what implications that would mean as far as pursuing, maybe if they had to pursue social security disability and stuff like that. But what I would encourage you, especially as a rehab counselor, is make sure you are up to date with what a person has and make sure you're reading in the DSM-5 at what spectrum is this person at, okay? Um, and I put this in here for you too. So basically goes into that effect there. Also, I'm gonna just read this here. Uh, the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder has been steadily on the rise and recent estimates suggesting that as many as one in 54 children have been identified with autism spectrum disorder or ASD in the United States. And it's 4.3 times more common in boys than girls. Most cases are thought to be the result of a polygenic disorder. Now, I'm not going to touch in details of polygenic disorder, but I'm encouraging you to read more about this. If you, this is your audience that you prefer to work with, especially helping them find jobs, um, because it's just going to help you to become better at taking care of them. Because a lot of times what usually happens, depending on the, the severity of the spectrum, uh, they're going to deal with things as far as like social communication problems. Maybe they, they, there's some issues with social interactions. They do certain repetitive patterns of behaviors depending on the severity. There's only restricted interests or activities. And of course, sensory activities. Uh, and depending on the type of support system that a person has is going to depend on the long-term uh, effects as they get older. Uh, for some people, they may improve over time, but if they do not have that social support, uh, some of their previous issues that they had going on tends to relapse. Um, now, why is that important in rehab counseling? 
because if you're working with somebody, especially they let's say they're high functioning autism, they're going to have some social skills issues that that most non-disabled people may think is strange. Um, I have personal experience working with somebody who's high functioning. And one of the key things that I know was helpful was ultimately having both the employees and the employer be inclusive in allowing that individual to work and showcasing their stuff. And the, right now the person, I worked with that person back in 2021. They're still working at their same job today. I think he got promoted twice already and they, they, they love him. You know, they put him in a position, love him there. They limited stuff. To, they help him to, to stay focused on certain things, but he stays pretty devoted to his job. Now, is that going to be for every case? No, but in some cases, yes, it can. So now in terms of the CRC, when they talk about autism spectrum disorder, you're going to need to read in details what are some of the symptoms or issues that the person is going in for services are dealing with and what's going to be the type of uh, treatment that they're getting and what kind of interventions are you going to give. If it's going to be job skills training, maybe it's going to be some applied therapy, maybe put them in supported work environments such as group homes or clubhouses. Um, that's what they're going to be asking you in the CRC. So if you're studying that and you let's say you know everything and stuff about autism spectrum disorder according to the DSM, then what you need to study is, well, what do they use to treat a lot of times? They use the same stuff that they use to treat ADHD as well as some additional things as well, like melatonin, methylphenidate, sterling, risperidone, risperidone, those kind of stuff. And of course, you know, what are going to be some of the su supportive treatment? And that for you, you're going to need to understand. Um, did any, does anybody want to share an experience that so far, maybe than their current work that they've worked with people that have some sort of unique abilities that are mentioned in some of these abilities that we talked about so far, and maybe share some of your experiences. Oh. I mean, I work with a kid who is, uh, that has like social anxiety or whatever at school. So we don't, we can't find, figure out what it is about him at school, but yet he has a very popular YouTube channel where he discusses like, um, like odd news and give his opinion, so opinion of it. He has a very large following and he's very comfortable doing that. He wants to be a news broadcaster, but yet in school, I mean, I, the whole time I was doing my internship, I probably heard him say six words. But yet, you know, every week he has his program and he has a lot of people that tune into it, you know, but it's just trying to figure out how to get him. Um, obviously, he has autism as well, but it's, it's hard to, you know, get him out of there because we don't work directly with um, like his physicians and stuff. So it kind of puts us in an awkward position as to prepare him for the future, I guess, you know? Okay, so, so works, you're working with transitioning youth and- um, Well, I'm working at the high school, yeah. Yeah, and so since you're doing more like, it sounds like you're doing more of the school counseling part there, the factor here is what other things has that child uh, been assisted with? And if now you know, it's and it's kind of hard to get in touch with the actual providers for that. And now, is there is there a? Uh, I, I know you're doing. I think it's for you. It's your internship, Tan. So, if you were the actual rehab counselor in that school, would you have more privileged access? Um, no, because I work alongside the rehabilitation counselor. Now, the diagnostician seemed to have a lot of clout per se, you know, but. There isn't really anything we can do about it. I, I look at how they have him in classes and we've started taking him out more so in the community and placing him in social events. Like um, we took him out to play kickball with some other kids from school. And that was a time from different schools, like the other uh, SPED department. And that's when I heard him, you know, actually say some words. But otherwise he just kind of, you know, stands back and doesn't say anything or like bites on his shirt. But if you were to see him on his YouTube channel, he is a, um, I hate to use the word normal, but 
there's no speech impediment there's no there's nothing to identify any type of limitation mm -hmm. within him that's so typical for kids who have autism they don't just have autism most kids have autism and adhd or they have some kind of other ability uh, most kids who uh, have autism are very they in general if they don't like something say if they don't like crowds but they have a huge passion for concerts and the only time they can be in a crowd is when they're going to concerts so it's a different focus that they have and a lot of the times it, does anybody remember the, the movie Rain Man? It was a movie with Tom Cruise. Yes, that was okay. my yes, mom's favorite I remember movie. That. Right? <laughs> okay, so that they used to call them savants, where they were like so super um, focused on one thing. I've had students who knew more about history than anybody could because that's all they did. Morning, noon, and night. That's all they did. All they did was read about history. All they did is watch movies about history. And there's no way you could ever compare or teach them. The best way to do that I found with um, kids who are on the scale is teach them social skills. A lot of them parrot. You know, they see what everybody else does. And if you're like in a situation where you're trying to figure out where to guide them, let them guide you because they know what they love and that's where they're going to succeed. They'll, they'll learn the socialization through being in class with everybody else. It's kind of like when kids don't play with each other, they play beside each other. And they learn through that. Um, there are a lot of different levels, of course. There are kids who are just violent. And you can't have them in, you know, the same room. There are kids who are not communicating. They, there are all types of, most of the kids on the spectrum just, they need to have that confidence. They need to, you need to let them grow. I say this because I have a child who is on the scale. And I learned most things from all the mistakes that I made with her. And learning from her, it they see the world so differently. And I know I got to get off this soapbox. I'm sorry. But it is, there's so many different levels to autism that you really need to get to know the child before you can even diagnose public school is one of the hardest places to do that because they're following rules that don't make sense for kids like this. Am I making sense? Wholeheartedly. Yeah. Thank you for letting me rant. Oh, no, you're fine. No, I appreciate it. Sharing both of that. And I think that that goes back to, you know, uh, there's an ethical dilemma on there because it's, it's one thing when, you find that child or that youth's desired interest versus what's mandated from them federally or mandated for them by the schools and the state and how you balance all that. And as far as up to what levels of interventions can you do? So, you know, and I think that, and I appreciate both of you sharing a little bit of that aspect on there, because I think that kind of applies with other disabilities, which we're going to talk here about intellectual disabilities, but I wanted to I heard the key thing from Tam was that this person has a restricted interest in activities. Only for that activity are they good at. Um, in some cases, depending on what it is, they may need some school social skills trainings just to do some of the base stuff so they can so they can be enriched in some of the work they do. So, and think about it just as a VRC counselor thinking about this is you know how do you use their disabilities as their main strength is one way I, I kind of think about that. And what that means is that if this person is a big YouTuber and they're doing a lot of videos and stuff like that, is can it, in today's world, I mean, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, <laughs> maybe even yeah, 15 years ago, 
you wouldn't think, oh, I just have a YouTube channel. I can make millions. Now you can be a blogger. You can be a YouTuber. People are making money. Thanks, Emily. Have a good night. You know, you can do that. It's a possibility. So you can use that on their strengths or whatever it is that they're talking about to build on that strength to make that connection. And not only make the connection, but help them to relate more, to be open to other opportunities. So it's an approach. So let's think of this in terms of the CRC exam. They can use an example like what Tam gave in a world situation says, you know, what would be what would be your interventions for that? And they will want you to know what would be the interventions. It includes applied behavior analysis. Uh, what kind of work placement would it be? Would it be a supportive work environment? Would it be a shelter workshop if they're severely disabled? Or is it going to be uh, job skills training? That, that in terms of CRC is what they're going to look for or they look from you to know the answer of. But thank you both so much for sharing that. So thank you. Um, so now very similar, like especially when Emily was mentioning about like violence, uh, we now have what's called intellectual disabilities. Some people still use this term today. And I think in some countries it hasn't been full, it hasn't fully gone away. So they may still call it mental retardation, but that's, terms no longer applicable it's now intellectually disabled uh that came when president barack obama came in and he changed that term and i think it's for the better you know um i think it's for the better uh basically it's it, by definition what it means is they have a significant limitation in both intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior so i'm mentioning this specifically because Previously, it was if they didn't meet a certain score on the IQ or intelligence quotient score, they were considered by definition mentally retarded. Now, it's not just an IQ test. They have to do, it's a list of social functionings or a list of various functionings of what the person can and cannot do to be deemed intellectually disabled. Okay. So I would encourage you to read in the book about those who have intellectual disabilities and at what ranges because not just range ranges does the person is the person considered intellectually disabled or not so one of the things that they're looking at is the social domain do they have empathy social judgment interpersonal communication skills ability to make and retain friendships etc definitely spoken to in the book um it talks about how they're functioning in daily life social and practical domains uh again includes Skills in language, reading, writing, math, reasoning, knowledge, and memory. Uh, with that, again, prior to the DSM-5 in 2013, they just needed to hit a score. So I think it was seven or below to be considered mentally retarded. Now that's changed. Now there's classified into different types of severity levels. So you, as a rehab counselor taking CRC, if you're being taught the older stuff, you're going to want to go back in the book and do some research and understanding how a person is classified as intellectually disabled. And it's by severity levels. There's mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And it's also based on the adaptive functioning of the disabled intellectual and not the IQ scores. So let me recap that real quick. IQ scores does not define somebody with an intellectual disability. It helps to identify a potential for intellectual disability. What does factor in somebody's level of intellectual disabilities is based on their adaptive functionings of what they can and cannot do. Have a good night, Jessica. So now, the other one here we're going to talk about, any questions about intellectual disabilities? If I'm also not mistaken, in the book, they also mention about uh, those who have Down syndrome. Uh, that until the dose intelligence just really that could apply to somebody with Down syndrome. It could apply to somebody with other related stuff like cerebral palsy and things like that. So the key thing as a counselor is if you're reading their, their clinical notes or if you understand what the person's adaptive, what they can and cannot do, that's going to help you determine if they have a severe level of functioning or not, regardless of the disability. Uh, the other one here, too, is now we're going to talk about here is epilepsy. Um, I have a good video on this, which I included in here. It's a silent video, but I think it does a really good job of visually explaining and showing you how uh, different statuses of seizures could emerge. Uh, most of the time people understand is the grand mal or the uh, generalized seizures, generalized and chronic tonics, 
or grand miles. Uh, and then, of course, there's the absence one, which is a pettit mile. And sometimes we also have simple partial. So for you studying as a candidate studying for CRC, you need to understand the difference between the tonic clonic, the pettit mile, simple partial, and complex partial. Because of the questions that the questions describing uh, a person who is who's showing symptoms of impaired consciousness, uh, they have repetitive motor movement and fumbling with hands. These are some examples of what? And you have a multiple choice answer, you need to know that it's probably a complex partial seizure. Now, if they're saying that the person has had a uh, recent seizure, they've been they they're they fell unconscious and they've been tremoring for the last five to ten minutes, that might be a severe thing of petit mal. Okay, so that's the stuff you're going to need to see and understand. And again, I would encourage you using this video because I think they do a good job describing that or at least visually showing you. Okay, so the thing with epilepsy, um, majority of the time, what what the book says and what I'm understanding is, is that most time when it comes to medication, it's usually a treatment for long term care. So they have to stay consistent. Uh, just like somebody who has, let's say, um, what do we call it? Schizophrenia. They have to adhere to medications to stay stable. It's the same thing with somebody who has epilepsy. And depending on the, the severity of epilepsy, they have to stay dedicated and be in adherence with the medication. And depending on what's prescribed to them, they may need to do blood testing. Uh, stress is a big factor in whether or not an uh, uh, epileptic seizure could occur. So do we want to put them in a high stressful job where they're going to end up hitting the ground or do we want to put in something that's not as stressful, but they can function, you know, they can function and do, and do work. Uh, is the seizure caused because they were playing a lot of video games? We hear about that. Alcoholism, is it inquired or was it, uh, uh, or was the person born with seizures? So understanding how the seizure affects the person is going to help you determine what kind of career that you want to put them into. I took this out of the book here as well inside the uh this comes directly out of the rep book and this talks about uh specific types of medications which most of the time they're they're underneath the category of aeds or anti-epileptic drugs uh some drugs like for example oxycarbazepine can sometimes be used to treat people with bipolar if you didn't know that uh so you may see depending on your clients you may see some people taking similar different types of medications, you got to ask yourself, is, is it because they have an epilepsy or is it a substance use disorder? Hint. Okay. But basically what they want you to know, if they're going to ask you in terms of, of medicine, is they're going to say, you know, if a person has a specific types of seizure, what kind of medication would you need to give them? Or what medication should they be taking? Or they're going to say, Tegredo, Neurotonin, Kepra, and Depotok are all stuff used to treat common things such as what? Epilepsy. Uh, any questions or thoughts on the section of epilepsy? No. no. All right. Well, that concludes our first half of the chronic illnesses and disability. Um, again, this is a very content heavy book. Uh, I think it's, if anything, either whether you get the exam that's going to give you majority of the questions coming from this or they're going to give you part of it, you are going to get asked at some point in the CRC exam about some disabilities, how they work, uh, how does it affect the person, what are the interventions, uh, what assist the devices, and maybe what even type of work environment would you put for them. And that's pretty much, I mean, in any VRC role, you do have to know that. You know, that's something you do have to know. Um, we'll cover the other stuff on Thursday because that's why it's a part two session. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording here. Thank you so much.